Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Dr. Yasser Javed uh, and uh, a GP with a specialist interest in cardiology in Northampton and I'll be your host uh, for the next uh, hour or so. Uh, and what a popular and critically important topic uh, we're going to cover, an area of medicine that often induces a lot of anxiety amongst colleagues, particularly in primary care, uh, where we often uh, work in relative isolation uh, without immediate uh, colleague support. So today we're going to give you some practical tips uh, to demystify the often dreaded task of reading an ECG. Uh, and we're also going to introduce a highly innovative AI technology that can seamlessly uh, integrate uh, into clinical practice uh, and will simply change the way you interpret ECGs forever. I've also had a, uh, you know, I've always had this passion for innovation, uh, particularly when it has the potential to revolutionize clinical practice, uh, streamline pathways, and ultimately uh, improve patient outcomes. I think the term game changer gets banded about a lot in medicine. It's very much overused, but it's entirely appropriate uh, for the topic of today's webinar. Uh, essentially, we are now in an era where you can interpret ECGs almost instantly uh, with at least the same expertise uh, as a cardiologist. Uh, and those times of looking at ECGs with trepidation, uh, they're finally over. And you can have the confidence of getting it right every time. And we are in for a treat uh, because it's a huge honor to be joined by quite simply one of the finest cardiologists of our generation, Dr. Fahar Khan, a very experienced EP cardiologist, uh, essentially an electrician of the heart, uh, he's based at St. Bart's in London and someone who not only shares with me uh, a huge passion for ECG interpretation, uh, but in my experience is about as good as it gets at interpreting an ECG. Uh, he sees things in an ECG that most mortals, uh, including myself, wouldn't even notice. So Fahar, uh, I would very much like to welcome you and thank you very much uh, for taking time uh, out of your diary. Thank you very much, Yasser, for that um, introduction. Um, <laughs> I wish I could live up to uh, your your words. But like yourself, I'm really excited about this evening. Uh, and really, what we're really excited about is the technology and sharing um, some of those great things. So really looking forward to it and sharing our uh, experience with, the, with all the viewers. Wonderful. I'm sure you will live up to it, Fahar. So uh, today, uh, as well as offering uh, you practical tips on how to make sense of an ECG, we're going to be uh, dissecting and appraising an AI technology for interpreting ECGs. Uh, Fahar, I know like me, you were initially very skeptical when you were introduced uh, to this technological solution, uh, which was claimed to be at least as good as a cardiologist in the mysterious art of ECG interpretation. But in a nutshell, uh, without giving too much away at this stage, please give a, a flavor for how excited you are by this uh, innovation. Yeah, so essentially um, you've got a pocket cardiologist. So um, the technology is very, very powerful. So I think we've lost uh, Fahar, is that, or is that <laughs> me? We'll, we'll come back to Fahar uh, in due course. Uh, clearly, the technology uh, is uh, is fantastic, but uh, not uh, on uh, Fahar's laptop at the moment. Uh, but I think it's fair to say uh, that uh, both of us, uh, you know, have been very surprised that our initial doubts uh, over this technology uh, have been overturned, uh, despite our best efforts at trying to sort of catch it out. Uh, and the ultimate reason uh, for its success. Uh, is that it's forensically analysed millions of patient cases, you know, far more ECGs than any of us would ever contemplate to see in a lifetime. And of course, unlike humans, it doesn't get de-skilled, uh, whereas we have to continually see a large volume of ECGs to maintain our skills. So you, for how you were so excited, I think you broke your sort of internet connection. But can you just say you were giving us a flavour for how excited you were uh, by the technology? <laughs> He's still having uh, uh, some issues, so we'll 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 just uh, we'll we'll get back to Fahar in due course. Um, but I think the I mean it's fair to say that uh, the emotions uh, for me and Fahar for this great innovation uh, they're also tinged with a little sadness. Uh, 
you know, despite finessing and honing our ECG interpretation skills for over two decades, uh, you know, we have to admit, uh, acknowledge that we are now matched by AI technology. And I guess just like Gary Kasparov had to accept in the 1990s, we have to come to terms for how with the fact that technology has finally caught up with our expertise. Yeah. I mean, I think that I think that's true. I, I think there's always going to be a role um, for for the experts, but I think the really major advantage of bringing the technology to primary care, to our patient, uh, to our um, uh, colleagues down in primary care, is really for the it's the right thing for the patient. It improves patient safety. It directs patient into the right care, and I think that is really what we're about. That's why we, we, we do this, and that's why we're really inter interested in this technology. As you rightly say, despite our initial skepticism, this really is technology that's going to revolutionise our patient care, and that is always exciting. Brilliant. Look, both uh, Fahar and I have not uh, and will not uh, receive any honorarium or payment uh, for our involvement in this webinar. Uh, we wanted to make it very clear that we're doing this out of our love for teaching, and also our excitement uh, at the technology we've been trialing uh, over the past few months. And I think it's fair to say, uh, I don't think I'm being biased, uh, that 12 lead ECG is a critical, uh, as well as should be a very high volume test in primary care. We should be liberally using it to hunt for things like uh, atrial fibrillation, the single leading independent risk factor for stroke. We should be using it to risk stratify our patients with sort of suspected underlying uh, coronary disease, structural heart disease, definitely be using it to hunt for target organ damage in our uh, hypertension reviews on a regular basis. We've got a large cohort of patients on antipsychotics, and it's very important that we keep an eye on that QTC interval, uh, because that could potentially uh, identify patients at high risk of a very bad outcome, as well as the routine risk stratifications of patients with palpitations, bradycardia, syncope, pre-syncope. I mean, in particular, the syncope and pre-syncope, we need to make sure we're not missing very high risk uh, uh, abnormalities uh, in relation to high degree heart block. And, and in fact, I think for today, what I thought was for how we could focus on, I think, two big ticket items in primary care, the, the you know, big roles for ECG uh, technology in the detection of atrial fibrillation, a huge national priority, as well as the you know, hunting for things like high degree heart block in our sort of elderly patients with these sort of high risk symptoms. And as most of you should be aware, atrial fibrillation is a key component of the uh, NHS long term plan. It's actually been identified as one of the biggest opportunities to save lives over the coming years with a huge emphasis on systematic improved detection of AF, which you can only do by ECG diagnosis. Uh, as well as, of course, uh, anticoagulation and stroke prevention. Uh, and of course, uh, AF, uh, we know is the single leading independent risk factor for stroke. Uh, lots of AF patients have other comorbidities which simply multiply that risk. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that most of us uh, are very uh, familiar with uh, you know, the rhythm in, of the heart when it's in normal sinus rhythm, this beautiful synchronized electrical depolarization initiated by that sinoatrial node smooth atrial depolarization hits the AV node where there's a slight delay to allow for ventricular filling and that's followed by ventricular depolarization but for her I'll bring you in uh, here I mean as an EP cardiologist I mean this is your bread and butter isn't it atrial fibrillation can you succinctly in language that we can understand uh, in primary care just describe exactly what atrial fibrillation is So I think probably one of the, the best analogies I can give you is if you imagine a football stadium and if you imagine there's a, um, a Mexican wave taking place in the football stadium, a very slow, regularized Mexican wave would be a regular sinus rhythm. And the football stadium essentially represents what's happening in the Asia. Now imagine that the crowd has gone absolutely wild and there's a riotous behavior. So if you are looking down at the stadium, you don't see organized activity, but you actually see very riotous, very disorganized activity. And that's what's happening in the atria. The atria will be contracting in a very irregular, a very chaotic way. And it'll be bombarding the AV node, as you rightly see in this right-hand side schematic. And what actually determines the rate is the way in which the AV node conducts. But because you're being constantly bombarded by this riotous behavior going on in the top end of the heart, you just have no control of the ventricle. So most patients 
will complain of their symptoms related to the high rates that you see in the ventricle. And that's that's where the issue is. And of course, the major risk, and I know yes, you're going to talk about this, yeah. is the prognosis related to this and stroke. And that's and that's what we're going to come on to. But essentially, AF, if you like, is a riot going on in your heart, very disorganized rhythm. You don't make sense of any organized activity, very chaotic. That's a tremendous uh, analogy. I might have to steal that for a future <laughs> For a future talk but actually before we even talk about ecg i mean clearly unless you're in complete heart block for her patients yeah. always going to have an irregular pulse in in, in persistent yeah. af is, is that still a very good cheap effective way of screening for uh, af uh, absolutely absolutely so you're going to have an irregular pulse and we talk about irregular irregularities and actually we've got some really really good examples of irregular ecgs which are not af which is why you have to be very very careful so the irregularly irregular pulse, that's the atrial fibrillation. That's the hallmark. That's what you'll always see uh, when you clinically examine these patients. But actually, not every irregular rhythm is AF, and that's where you can get caught out. And yeah. we'll, we will demonstrate that later. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we'll make it very clear. You cannot establish yeah. a diagnosis. You can rule out AF from a pulse check, but you definitely yeah. can't diagnose it without an ECG. Yeah. And the, the main very reason, important. yeah, the main reason yeah. we are very hot on detecting AF is because look at what happens to the heart uh, as soon as it goes into AF. So this is a transesophageal echo looking at the left side of the heart. Uh, you've got the mitral valve here separating yep. your left atrium and left ventricle. For her, just explain to us what's happened uh, to this heart and, and what is the risk of this heart going into atrial fibrillation? Yeah, so what, what you've got, this is a transesophageal echo, echocardiogram. So what this means is that the patient is uh, unconscious, usually with sedation, but could be under general anesthesia. And there's a probe inserted through the gullet, through the esophagus, and we're looking at the heart from behind. And, and as you rightly labeled, you've got the bit here, which is the left atrium. This here is the mit mitral valve. But you probably can't see my mouse, but uh, between the left atrium and the left ventricle is the mitral valve. The bit that's circled is the left atrial appendage. It's the bit that sticks out. It's the part of the heart where there is um, static blood flow. And you can just about, at the bottom of this image, make out that there is something not quite right. You can see a little defect there, a little ball, a little sort of uh, area which um, looks like a little, essentially like a little ball, that little green area that you can see. And that's suspicious of a clot. And I think if we look at some further images, which I think you've got, yeah, so you'll well, be able before to see we, before we move like. on, be, um, Before we this, move on, so Fahad, before we move on to those further images, I want to make the point here very clearly. Uh, this can occur very quickly, yeah. can't it? I remember when I was uh, a house officer, there used to be this 48-hour window where you could cardiovert without yeah. anticoagulation. But I think uh, you guys are a bit more cautious even now. I'm much, much more cautious. And actually, there is uh, some very, very good data. And I think, very, very briefly, the, the best data that we have is patients who've got pacemakers where you're actually constantly monitoring what's happening to the atrial rhythm. Essentially, it shows that you only need um, a few minutes of AF a day over a short period of time to have that risk of a clot. And that is the major, major rationale where even if patients have undergone treatment such as ablation, so when they come back to see you, they've had an ablation and you ask the question, why do they still need to be on the blood thinner? And the reason for that is, even though the ablation may have eliminated the symptoms and got rid of 99% of the AF, even if this patient has a small amount of AF, they're still at risk of clots. And here, this is a very good example where you see this absolutely huge clot in the appendage. You can see this in the red circle, very clearly illustrated. It, a very well demarcated um, uh, area, which is a clot in the left atrial appendage. If that breaks off or part of it breaks off or the whole thing breaks off, you can have a catastrophic event, usually a stroke, but it, you can get a clot in other systems. So this is really, really significant uh, prognostically important to identify these patients and make a difference. And just to give you guys a sense of scale, the distance between these two blue dots is one centimeter. You know, these these are massive. This is far far more devastating than other clots that cause a, a stroke. And and for hard just to remind the audience, aspirin is a, has been proven to be a pretty uh, ineffective treatment at preventing these. This this is not a platelet rich clot. This is a large fibrin thrombin clot. What what's the treatment exactly. of choice for these patients? Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. So the treatment of choice is DOAX, and that's the treatment of choice that we use. Uh, uh, previously used to use warfarin, but now we use uh, DOAX. And actually, you will rightly point out two things. Number one, it's not a platelet-rich uh, environment. So even though aspirin may have a little bit of benefit, the uh, overall benefit of aspirin is 
wiped out by the bleeding risk of aspirin. So essentially what you do when you give aspirin, you give them a drug which may thin the blood a little bit, does not prevent the risk of a stroke, but actually raises their risk of bleeding. It is not the right thing to do under these circumstances. Aspirin is completely, completely not recommended with atrial fibrillation. You must give them a DOAC. And the old data that we have, we've completely re-looked at all of that work. It is not a good drug in atrial fibrillation. No, in fact, we coined the phrase for her in the Midlands of uh, aspirin yeah. for stroke prevention in AF is almost a placebo yeah. plus bleeding uh, option for yeah. these patients. Yeah. So, guys, look, look at this slide. If a picture tells a thousand words, it's this slide. Yeah. Think of atrial fibrillation as a ticking time bomb. You know, your job in primary care in particular, these are where these patients are, are sitting mainly, is to screen, diagnose and anticoagulate the patients before the stroke. Think of it as a race. You don't want yeah. that stroke to sort of win the race. Because as Fahar rightly points out, when this clot breaks off, it doesn't go around the bend of the aorta. It, you, they usually go straight up the carotids and usually block major arteries. I mean, things like the proximal MCA uh, artery, middle cerebral artery, the major motorway of brain circulation. Uh, and the resulting uh, 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 neurological deficit is huge. Here you've got a, a good example of an AF stroke. You know, that's total anterior circulation damage. Look at the midline shift because of all the swelling around that infarct. Clearly, this patient isn't going to have a good outcome. And whichever way you slice and dice the data, it's very obvious that AF strokes are far worse than even other strokes with a much higher mortality, morbidity and disability. These are not patients that are going to be walking away from hospital, even if they survive uh, their stroke. And for her, this is very, very worrying data from the European Society of Cardiology. Talk to us about the prevalence and e e epidemiology of AF. It's almost a pandemic. Yes, absolutely. And as we're living longer, um, a as you get older with atrial fibrillation, you're more likely to get that, that riotous behavior in the heart. You're more likely to be driven by uh, things such as high blood pressure, more likely to be driven by age. It makes you much, much more susceptible to going to atrial fibrillation. So as you rightly say, the epidemic here will be for stroke risk. And as those previous slides demonstrated, an AF-related stroke carries a much, much more devastating outcome, much, much more expensive, much, much more likely to require institutional care, much, much more likely to have a, a more significant physical uh, deficit. So absolutely vital to find these patients. And given that it only needs a few minutes of atrial fibrillation, you'll need to get in there early. There's a really good question on the chat, actually, yeah, yeah, so which I think is really worth addressing. And the question was, do we have to um, anticoagulate somebody with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? And that's an excellent question. Yeah. And the answer is absolutely. We treat paroxysmal atrial fibrillation just like persistent atrial fibrillation. And the reason is because, we, as we talked about earlier, you don't need a lot of AF in order for a clot to develop, in order for you to alter the prognosis of your patients. So if you see AF, you assess the child's vascular score and you uh, anticoagulate accordingly. In fact, Fahad, that's made it pretty easy, isn't it? Because it, well, it's almost like if the heart loves the taste of AF. Once it's gone into AF once, <laughs> you know it's going to go yeah. back into AF again. But look at this statistic on this slide, guys. I mean, for how is this true? One in three patients are likely to develop AF uh, before they die. You know, if, if you if you if you've lived to the age of fifty five, you've now got a one in three lifetime risk of AF. I mean, that is almost considered part of the normal aging process for some patients. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at the average age in the UK of eighty five for a male and a little bit older for females, at that rate, you will have at least a one in four. And now I think the data shows one in three patients who will develop atrial fibrillation. So I think wow. uh, epidemic is, is the right word here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, compound, compounded by other risk factors. Yeah. And this is, uh, for me, the most tragic data. This shows that uh, AF stroke is the first presentation of AF uh, in 50% of AF strokes. And that is tragic. You know, we clearly need to make sure stroke is not winning the race uh, that frequently and the only way to do that is to be proactive in our detection uh, of atrial fibrillation age remains probably the leading risk factor but for give us a flavor for what are the other risk factors that can really drive af things like obesity hypertension yeah, etc yeah. give, give us a flavor yeah so age is the big one that we use so over the age of 65 you'll get a point and then of course the other big ones is high, high blood pressure high blood pressure is a major uh, issue here it causes which causes stretch of the atria and that makes you more susceptible to atrial fibrillation as you allude to diabetes, if there is already a history of some form of vascular disease, like peripheral vascular disease, 
if you're known to have LV dysfunction for some reason, if a patient's got heart failure, uh, they're more likely to develop episodes of atrial fibrillation. If you've got coronary disease, so your population of patients who've had a previous stent, these patients are at risk of atrial fibrillation as well. And then we've got the lifestyle. We've got the patients who are overweight. That causes changes in the, uh, in the way in which electricity moves around in the atria. Uh, alcohol is a, can be a major trigger. We talk about alcohol and caffeine as uh, triggers where there's an underlying susceptibility. So but the underlying susceptibility is the, is the things we talked about, blood pressure, diabetes, coronary disease, LV dysfunction, and then, of course, valvular disease. Sometimes uh, in some countries, um, valvular disease is prevalent. In the UK, less so, uh, but primary valvular disease can also be an issue. And then, of course, uh, the other thing not to miss is the thyrotoxic patient. So that is something that often people get caught out on. Um, and what you're trying to say, Fahar, is we've got to screen for it in virtually all of our chronic disease reviews. We've just got to we've got to do it before the, the stroke ensues. And I guess we mustn't miss the uh, yeah. obstructive sleep apnea as well. Uh, so let's move on to the diagnosis of, uh, of AF. I'm going to start off with sinus rhythm because I think most of us would be confident diagnosing a patient in sinus rhythm. If you look at the ECG in sinus rhythm, we're going to look for those, you know, identical sort of looking P waves. Uh, then there's a little gap. Let's yeah. zoom in on that. You can see a P wave, a little gap representing that AV node delay. And then every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. And that's your normal sinus rhythm. The P wave representing smooth atrial depolarization, the QRS representing ventricular depolar depolarization. So far, talk us through the ECG changes in atrial fibrillation. So as you rightly see on the right-hand side, what you see is a very different ECG to the ECG on the left. But the first thing that you immediately notice is that actually the ECG on the right is not as regular as the ECG on the left. That's the first thing, which is very, very obvious. The second thing that you see is that you've got a, a very wavy baseline and the very, very clear P waves that you can see on the left-hand side. So you start right on the left-hand side of that ECG on the left in the sinus rhythm. You've got a P wave, then you've got the tall QRS, then you've got the T wave, then another little hump, which is the P wave, you see that that is essentially removed from the ECG on the right. You've got a very wavy baseline, but you can't clearly make out any clear P wave activity. Very wavy, uh, very regular. And that's because the atria aren't really contracting. They're, 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 they are fibrillating. So they're just quivering. They're just shivering. They're not actually having firm contractions, which is giving your clear P waves. And that's what is represented in this wavy baseline, an absence of clear electrical activity. And that's what you see here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it, Fahad? No obvious yeah. P waves, irregular QRS rhythm. You've basically diagnosed yeah. uh, atrial fibrillation. But putting it to practice is often a little bit problematic. I mean, here we've got a patient who presented uh, <laughs> yeah. with a bit of breathlessness, you know, maybe yeah. signs of heart failure. Again, we see this irregular QRS rhythm. But for her, a lot of colleagues will be wondering, is that, you know, there are waves in between these QRS complexes. Like, for instance, I get asked, how do you know whether that's a P wave or a T wave, for instance? Can you throw some light on an ECG like this? Well, it can, it can be difficult, actually. Yes. I mean, uh, the, 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 this, as far as the T wave is concerned, you would expect that the gap between that QRS, that big tall spike, and the T wave should be really consistent. But actually, when you've got an ECG, which is this irregular and rapid, and actually the whole thing is condensed, as you can see in the middle of that ECG, it's not that straightforward. And actually, some people can sort of look at this and think, oh, is there P waves buried in there? When we look at this, the, the first thing that, that should really, really give you that clue is the fact that it is very irregular and there's no pattern to the regularity, irregularity rather. And I think that is your really first guide with the atrial fibrillation. But that can in some patients still be confusing because you look at this and think, mm, is there atrial activity there? And that's where often uh, people can sort of fall down. And that's where you need to have a really, really careful look at what's actually happening in the rhythm strip. And that's where you need the confidence of a tool that will allow you to actually uh, help you distinguish what's happening in these uncertain areas. And I think this is really where um, uh, oh. this can be very, very helpful. Okay. But let's, before we move on to the uh, technology, uh, so this is actually fast atrial fibrillation, we'll cut to the chase. Uh, ECG machines are pretty good at working out the rate, but if you guys want a quick and easy way of working out the rate, uh, on normal settings, uh, the rhythm strip is roughly 10 seconds. So if you if you simply count the number of QRS complexes on the rhythm strip, which in this case, I was doing it while you were talking for 29. Uh, so that gives yeah. you a rate of, a, that's a very fast rate of 174. Can you just clarify 
uh, the importance of rate control in AF. Uh, how, how important is it that we make sure patients, uh, we rein in that heart rate? Yeah, so there, there are essentially two uh, problems with very fast rates. Number one is the symptoms. Patients are very uncomfortable. They can get lightheaded, they can get dizzy, they can feel palpitations, they can feel breathless. Um, so that's one, um, uh, so that's the, uh, the major issue. The second issue is that very rapid conduction in the ventricle can cause um, dysfunction of the heart. So you can end up with heart failure, the so-called tachycardia-related heart, um, heart failure that we see with atrial fibrillation. So it's very, very important to control the heart rate because you can actually cause the heart to go to heart failure. The good news is it's reversible. So if you control the rate, you can see heart function improve significantly. But no, there are two reasons. One is the symptoms that the patient has described. And the second thing is the risk of heart failure under these circumstances. So that's why rate control here is very effective. Fantastic. So we're going to do uh, move on to another ECG. This was an ECG done on a patient uh, who attended a diabetic review. 78-year-old, diabetes, probably hypertension, you know, all the risk factors that Fahar talked about. And a very proactive uh, clinician checked the pulse, found it was irregular and had the great uh, foresight to do a speedy ECG. Now, this time, again, let's just focus on that rhythm strip at the bottom. Again, we can see a sort of irregular uh, response. But again, for her, you know, for you, for us, maybe we've seen lots of ECGs. This is a fairly straightforward ECG to decipher, but it can catch yeah. out some of our yeah. sort of primary mm -hmm. care colleagues. Any tips again on, uh, on, 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 on sort of demystifying an ECG like this? Yeah, again, I think the, the main area I think here is the, the, the fact that you've got this, the, this irregular baseline, this irregularly irregular baseline. And actually, there are the, the other area, the other thing to note is that not all activity on that baseline represents clear atrial contraction. And that's where you get confused. You see, oh, could this be a P wave? Could this be a P wave? If you have to think to yourself, could this be a P wave? It probably isn't. And uh, P waves are really, really very clear. And that's yeah. why um, uh, I think the, the, the irregularity of the ECG is probably the biggest giveaway. And then yeah. if you're really thinking hard about P wave, you need to look for consistency. Is it before every QRS? No, then it's probably not a P wave. And therefore exactly. that will help you a little bit more uh, understanding. Yeah. Yes, exactly but, right. Really, true P really waves tr true P yeah. waves should be very easy to, to, to notice yeah. almost within a, within a few seconds of looking at the ECG. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, not at all. There's a, there's a really couple of really interesting themes that are coming in the chat. And I think one of the themes is the, the basic technology. We've been showing lots of ECGs, the 12 lead ECGs, but there's some comments about technologies like the Cardio Mobile, which will pick up a tracing, such as the Apple Watch. And actually, my clinical experience is that these technologies that patients bring with the Apple Watch or the Cardio Mobile give very good quality tracings for us to make diagnoses. So that is uh, something that uh, if you see it, if you see it on those ECGs, then yes, the diagnosis is there. So there's a lot of questions around yeah. what technologies are around to detect this. And, and actually, these are very effective technologies. You just have to look at the tracing, and if it gives you clear data, then you can make a diagnosis. I mean, I mean, the key is, uh, obviously, you need a good quality trace, but I think even the European Society of Cardiology now has a Class 1A recommendation. You can establish a diagnosis of AF yeah. from sort of single lead ECG uh, technology. Right, let's move on. Now let's introduce this uh, technology, PM Cardio, this AI machine learning uh, technology, uh, which will basically, what we're trying to say is it's going to get rid of the guesswork and the stress of interpreting ECGs like the ones we've just shown you. So if, if you've got a smartphone, you download the app, uh, you simply take a picture of the ECG, whether it's on your computer screen, whether it's a paper version, and literally within seconds, you get a very accurate uh, diagnosis. And depending on the clinical information you've inputted, you'll get an evidence-based guideline recommended uh, treatment uh, uh, signposting, uh, and which can be personalized uh, to that patient. So if we go back to that ECG we just showed you, let's see what the app, what the AI technology PM Cardio app uh, does for this ECG. Firstly, it cleans it up, it digitizes it on your smartphone, and you actually often get an ECG that's much easier uh, to interpret. Uh, and then when we look at the uh, ECG uh, uh, diagnosis uh, from the app, you can see a very straightforward, uh, clear diagnosis, atrial fibrillation, rapid ventricular response. And then, as I said, you can get a treatment recommendation, which will not just guide you through the stroke prevention, but also the appropriate rate control and possibly the criteria for whether the patient may be appropriate for a, a consideration of a rhythm control strategy. So, so far, this is really straightforward.
easy to use technology and, and i know you've been trialing it for a while and have been very impressed with the sort of accuracy yeah. of it yeah absolutely and the key thing is actually it removes the doubt and any sort of doubts that you may have about some of the things that we've already talked about some of the um the doubts that come in because you know these are big decisions do i anticoagulate the patient uh what i do under these circumstances this technology gives you the confidence on the basis of your own clinical judgment to absolutely tell you what the answer is. And even if your clinical judgment is really shaky, you think, I really don't know, this technology has sensitivity and specificity to be able to help you make those decisions. Yeah. It, remo it will just remove the stress, remove yeah. the guesswork. Now, this is an ECG that I think everyone in primary care needs to look at very carefully. This was actually part of a significant event review. I'm not going to go into individual details but it was from the midlands i was i was involved in the significant event review this is where a gp made an ecg diagnosis you can see the ecg proprietary software diagnosed atrial fibrillation interestingly also on the same uh, bit of paper says normal ecg so a bit of a contradictory statement uh, but when we look at the rhythm strip it does fair to say it does look pretty irregular especially when we mark out the qrs complexes you would say that's an irregular QRS rhythm but the slight issue here is and it is a poor quality ECG but the slight issue here is there are clearly P waves on that ECG so let's run the PM cardio app on this ECG and you can see immediately this is very striking how it really cleans up the ECG and for her it becomes obvious that we now have QRS complexes that don't have a P wave so can you just clarify what are these QRS complexes without a P wave so this is the these are the premature um, atrial complexes that you've got here. So these are the uh, premature complexes that you've got um, uh, in in this patient. And actually, what was being what was the confusing aspect of this is that you had very clear evidence of an irregularity of the heartbeat. And actually, the algorithm and the GP the GP probably just went to what the what the what the uh, ECG had interpreted. But this is clearly. Um, sinus rhythm with uh, uh, ectopic activity and that's the issue here under these circumstances in fact in lead one you can see that there is a slightly different p wave you can see that can you see that right at the top and that yeah. suggests that there's a probably an atrial ectopic that's doing that and actually the the pm cardio is able to pick this up and gives yeah. you that can you see that there's a, right after the t wave there's that little nubbin which is that atrial ectopic uh, and that's what you've got here and what is it called? absolutely premature complexes and the spot on yeah and uh... I mean, it's really sad to uh, actually go on with this story, but this patient was incorrectly diagnosed with AF, anticoagulated, and sadly suffered a, a catastrophic intracranial bleed as a result of that completely unnecessary anticoagulation. As, as Fahar says, I think it's an easy mistake to make. You know, we're very sort of resource strapped in, the, uh, in primary care, like most areas of the NHS. We've got very little time to review in you know, a paperwork, ECGs, I think the GP must have just seen this diagnosis, had a quick glance at that rhythm strip, does look very irregular. And if you don't look at it in more detail, you're going to you're going to be caught out. Uh, had this uh, a technology been available for her, this could have prevented a really catastrophic outcome. We've now got a fairly young patient lying in a nursing home with a peg tube aphasic and completely hemiplegic, spending their last few months not being able to speak, move half their body or, or speak. So, so I think this really does reinforce the value uh, of that technology. All right, let's move on to another ECG example. We're just giving you a series of ECG examples to show how, you know, it's all very well known the theory, uh, but it's often not as straightforward in clinical, clinical practice, particularly when the quality of the ECG isn't great. And we often see these type of uh, quality ECGs in primary care. So again, the ECG machine has diagnosed atrial fibrillation. Look at the rhythm strip. Again, as Fahar has highlighted, look at the rhythm. It does look irregular. Z uh, whip yeah. out your smartphone, get the PM Cardio app uh, uh, sort of to have a digitized version of this ECG. Uh, by the way, every ECG machine, as you can see at the bottom, will say in small print, uh, you must review the data by a qualified per a physician. So basically, whatever diagnosis it comes up with is advisory, not black and white diagnostic. And when we when we use the PM Cardio app, yes, it again cleans up the uh, the ECG. But for hard this time, we're seeing uh, QRS complexes that do look sort of different morphology. So so please demystify this ECG for us. 
So here again, once again, you've got provincial complexes, you've got, once again, you've got um, a, a topic activity. And here you can see, once again, you've got sinus beats here preceding this. So once again, you've got premature complexes. And um, uh, one, once again, this could be confused for atrial fibrillation uh, on first glance, but you do need to look at this carefully. And this is not about blaming anybody in primary care because actually this is this is the whole purpose of this is to provide you with the confidence to be able to look at some of these ECGs, which are not that straightforward. And once again, it gets it right. It tells us the sinus rhythm because there are QRS complexes with a P wave, but there are additional premature complexes. And that's what the ECG is uh, telling us. Um, and that's how the, um, uh, the algorithm has picked that up uh, very effectively. So for hard 10 out of 10 for this diagnosis? By yes. the app, wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely, that's a relief. That's a relief. Okay, uh, uh, this is a case of a patient uh, who was uh, suffering palpitations, actually, but benign-sounding palpitations. We end up doing an ECG in primary care. Uh, the, the 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 clinician was very inexperienced at looking at ECGs, but he was concerned with this diagnosis of flutter with four to one AV conduction. Uh, I mean, that ECG looks fairly uh, okay to me for her. Let's run the app through it. Uh, and the app says normal sinus rhythm. What does the leading cardiologist in the country uh, say for her? What is this? Why is this ECG machine put four to one a uh, block with AV conduction and flutter? Uh, well, I don't know. Well, this is sinus rhythm. Uh, but I've looked at this ECG quite a bit and I am not sure <laughs> where it got the information about atrial flutter and, and I really cannot see how it's done that. Um, and that just really shows the limitation of what is out there. And if clinical decisions were made upon the basis of the output of this, once again, we could have had another catastrophic event. So it's very, very difficult to justify why the algorithm got it so yeah. badly wrong, in, uh, um, which the PM Cardia absolutely uh, recognized it very clearly. So, so far, you can understand from a primary care perspective, we get reports like yeah. this from the ECG machine. Absolutely. It does create a lot of uh, confusion and concern absolutely. for us. And it's not just about catastrophic outcomes. I mean, this could have uh, en ended up generating a completely unnecessary referral, further clogging yeah. up uh, very sort of resource limited uh, yeah. NHS uh, waiting lists. So I think yeah. um, for me, this is really phenomenal technology. I have to say, I, I do trial a lot of technology. I'm a massive fan of portable ECG technology. Uh, for instance, electronic stethoscope technology is advancing at a rapid pace. But out of all the technologies that I've experienced in recent times, this is the one that's got me the most excited. I mean, if you just look at some of the validation data, so this is validation uh, compared to GPs in the detection of AF we have this 46% uh, average improved detection of atrial fibrillation. And you can also see a significant reduction uh, in equally important uh, false negatives. So Farah, I want to think, take this opportunity to signpost to you, because I know you've looked at personally uh, trialing this out, your own personal experiences for the yeah. accuracy and validation, but you can also share with us some of the great data that is available on this technology. So we have actually repeated some of the work that has been done because we, we have access to a lot of ECGs. It's very easy for us to, to be able to do that. But, but in essence, this was a this is a really nice uh, study. So essentially what it does is it there is it's a very busy slide, but essentially you've got these four four blocks in each of the various particular um, uh, ECG uh, criteria that has been picked up. And essentially what you're doing is you're comparing the algorithm, the PM cardio algorithm against an experienced cardiologist versus a general practitioner. And actually, if you look across the board, whether you're looking at heart block or whether you're looking at the rhythm, the um, the algorithm does superbly well compared to what you're comparing against with the cardiologist. So the cardiologist and the algorithm uh, correlate in their findings very well. And actually here, this is this is highlights why this type of technology is needed, because it shows that in primary care that it really does, you do need additional um, safety measures, you do need additional technology to help get that diagnosis correct. And that's just the nature of the way in which we practice medicine. So here, that safety margin is really, really clearly seen. So for example, if you look at the way in which you're diagnosing heart blocks in the first column, you're going to have a percentage of patients where heart block is missed. And again, these are patients who may end up needing to go into hospital and need emergency treatment. And if you look at the rhythm, which is the, the fifth set of uh, blocks, uh, you're going to miss a number of patients where the rhythm will be abnormal and in whom treatment can be started. So you can see that really there are a number of 
um, uh, conditions here that the PM cardio uh, can certainly provide significant support in primary care to, in order to get the right diagnosis for the very sick patients, but also to really for AF detection. Um, and really nice piece of work. Uh, this was done with uh, approximately 300 patients uh, in comparison. Um, there are a number of other studies that have looked at large numbers of patients. So this is a very good uh, study that was done in Amsterdam. So again, almost 300 patients uh, which looked at a comparison, and this is the data we've looked at. So it looked at the comparison between the technology versus the cardiologist. And there was excellent correlation in the diagnostic accuracy between the algorithm and the specialist review of the ECG. And actually for AF, really it's, um, uh, the, 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 the authors have reported as near perfect. The sensitivity and specificity are around 99% for AF detection for this algorithm. So that really is your significant prognostic disease conditions, and it really is uh, excellent technology for this. Um, yeah. In the whole cohort, there was about 25% uh, of patients had an, uh, an ECG abnormality. So 75% of the patients, you didn't need to do anything. So that's also a very important message coming through. But actually, where the pathology was, half of that 25% had AF detection, uh, AF was picked up. And you can see that the technology really helps you get patients onto the right treatment pathways. So there was a question in the in the thanks for that, Fahar. I mean, this is very yeah. reassuring validation. There's a question in the chat about what do we mean by cleaning up the ECG? I guess what we're trying to say is in many ECGs done, uh, particularly in suboptimal settings, you get a bit of artifact and noise. And and what the uh, a PM cardio app does is it, it sort of tries to remove the sort of noise to to, to get a cleaner sort of image of, of the actual uh, electrocardiac graphic uh, tracing, and that really does help uh, with the visualization of, of, of what's going on. Um, I think we're just going to move on uh, in the interest of time to the other area we want to focus on: heart block. For heart, this is an area that creates a lot of trepidation and confusion in primary yeah. care. I, I, I suspect it's because it's often overcomplicated when it's taught by uh, certain cardiologists um but uh, the, the thing about av block and that's what cardiologists refer to it as atrioventricular block what you're looking at is something uh, is present now uh, an abnormality trying to prevent the impulse getting from the atria to sort of the bundles of the heart so, you know preventing impulse getting from the atria to the ventricles and it's referred to as av block i think we're all aware of the uh, stratification of it. But if you think about the electrics of the heart, we're talking about abnormalities predominantly involving the AV node and beyond. So AV node structures like the bundle of Hiss. Uh, and the conventional stratification is first, second, and third degree. Obviously cardiologists cannot cope with such a simple stratification system. <laughs> so they further stratified second degree into a sort of Mobitz type one and Mobitz type two. But for me, Fahar, I, I find it, straightforward to sort of classify heart block into two categories it's either going to be a low risk which basically yeah. involves uh issues at the level of the av node because the av yeah. node has so much redundancy uh, unless you're an ep cardiologist you're not going to completely destroy your av node uh, but yeah. then obviously we one of the biggest red flags in, in in primary care ecg diagnosis is not to miss the high degree or high risk av block which is basically damage sort of distal conduction tissue damage where there is very little redundancy sort of left in the system. So if we start off with first degree heart block, which is basically not usually natural aging and sort of fibrosis of the AV node. So for her, why does the AV node, first of all, in a normal heart, what is the purpose, physiological benefit of, of the AV node delaying the impulse uh, between the atria and the ventricle? There is a slight delay, isn't there? And that's why you get a PR interval. Exactly, so the PR up to 200 milliseconds, a fifth of a second, and that's just to allow filling of the ventricle. So allow to, the blood to fill in the ventricle, it just delays the signal, and then it pushes the signal down the big wires, then to allow the heart to contract. So that delay is very, very important for the mechanics. So the electrics and the mechanics have to keep up with each other. The signal gets there, gets there really, really early, you have a little pause, and then the ventricle fills up, and then it can eject the blood out. So that's the purpose of the AV, AV delay. What about these elderly patients? We often uh, get incidental findings where the PR interval has, has increased. That's telling us the AV node's damaged and it's sort of delaying that uh, that that uh, AV conduction uh, more than it previously would. So so this is the typical yeah. ECG we get. 
So what's your what what do we do with these? Uh, I mean, at the level of the AV node, all the, the rest of the ECG is normal. Is this anything to worry about? Nothing to worry about. Uh, if you have a little bit of prolongation of the PR interval, nothing to worry about at all in these patients. As you get older, you get wear and tear in the junction box, if you like, in the middle of the heart, and you would expect to see some slowing down of the electricity. It may be the first sign that you may get trouble down the line, but progression of first degree AV block into something significant, that's not thats not something that should concern or worry us, and it is actually quite common in your elderly population. Very extreme PR intervals when it's really, really long, and sometimes we see this, uh, that can be an issue. But in a lot of patients where the PR interval is stretched a little bit, 220 milliseconds, 250 milliseconds, we expect to see that. That's nothing to be yeah. too concerned about. Okay. Nothing I mean, to be done. Bucket... You can yeah. say low risk. Yeah. Low risk. So heart, heart block is, is not a very patient-friendly term. So maybe in primary care, if you see this incidental finding yeah. in an elderly patient, low risk. It, might, yeah. it might be worth just explaining to the patient this is probably normal uh, for the patient's sort of age. By the way, yeah. you don't have to measure PR intervals. I think as long as there's not many ectopics on the ECG, yep. the ECG machine does measure the uh, yep. intervals quite accurately. So for her, yep. I, I only remember three numbers uh, in terms of intervals, a normal PR interval, no more than 200, a normal yep. QRS duration, no more than 120 milliseconds and QTC around 460, awesome. maybe a bit higher for, for women. Is is that fair enough? Just just these That's broad Absolutely. Yep, yeah. absolutely. That's a very you, good... Do you agree? We, I mean, we've completely destroyed uh, proprietary ECG software analysis, but do you agree that the numbers are fairly accurate, though? Yeah, some of those numbers can be very accurate. I think sometimes the QRS um, can, can be an issue, but actually relying on the PR interval here is reliable. And actually, it's really interesting when you're talking about heart rate. Heart rate is probably the most reliable. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Yeah. So let's move on now. We've gone first degree. Let's move on to second degree type one, maybe it's type one block. Again, this is the level of the AV node. And for her, we often see this, you know, uh, ambulatory ECG patients are at night, yeah. presumably with a high vagal tone. What's going on in these ECGs? Explain it to us. So, yeah, so the second degree AV block, as you rightly said, was of two types. But the fundamental issue with second degree AV block is that you get a dropped beat. So if you think about that, so the second degree is a dropped beat. And the difference between the two is what's happening to the PR interval before the beat drops. If the PR interval gradually lengthens and then drops, that's type one. And that's usually within the AV node, considered to be low risk, as you rightly pointed out, the so-called Venkiback phenomenon. The other type is where you get a drop of the beat. So the primary thing in the second degree is the beat drops. So either the PR interval prolongs before it drops. If it doesn't prolong before it drops, that's where you get your two to ones, as you rightly show here. And that's a little bit more troublesome because that suggests that actually the block is below the AV node, possibly in the in the his system or further down here. The QRS is normal, so it's probably infrahistian. And that suggests that the disease is beyond the AV node. And that's a little bit more of a worry. And that's why this is a little this is considered to be the, in the high risk category. So in conclusion, second degree AV block, the demystifying second degree AV block is all based on the very simple principle that you get a dropped beat. And if the PR interval prolongs before it drops, it's type one, don't worry about it. If it doesn't prolong and it just drops suddenly, then that's of concern. So I guess the way to think about it, if it drops before, um, while uh, when you get some prolongation before, then you've got a little bit of a warning. Anything which has a bit of a warning is going to be low risk. But if it just drops suddenly without any warning in the PR interval, then you know that's going to be a bit more uh, high risk. And so where ha something happens without a warning, that's a higher risk entity. So if you think about it like that, you can think about what's actually happening with the drop beat. So, so for her, this is a, a patient who's getting sort of pre-syncopal episodes almost yep. with this ECG. I mean, that, that should be an urgent referral, shouldn't it, for assessment Absolutely. for a pacemaker? Needs to, yeah. needs to go to hospital. If they, certainly with, the, with symptoms like this, they need to go to hospital. Absolutely, 100% get a pacemaker. So I think of this as almost that distal, significant distal conduction tissue damage. I mean, this is teetering on uh, sort of almost complete heart block, which will now uh, sort of move on to incomplete heart block, uh, where yeah. there's no connection really electrical connection between the atria uh, and the ventricles these patients often are yep. quite symptomatic short short-lived blackouts no warning sort of come to very quickly so i'll talk yep. us through this ecg and i'll make it a little bit easier by marking out the very regular p wave activity nothing wrong with the yep. sa node uh, in this patient but what's going on in this patient yeah so hey there's absolutely no relationship between what's happening in the with the p wave and the qrs so this is complete heart block so this is block where there's no communication between the atria and the ventricle 
absolutely no relationship. And you can clearly see that. As you've rightly done, you've mapped out where all the P waves are. And if you map out all the QRSs, they will also be regular, but they're going at different uh, rates. It's essentially uh, as if there are two separate entities happening uh, within the heart. And this is a complete miscommunication between the top chambers of the heart and the bottom chambers of the heart. And this requires emergency pacing. So basically, uh, the way I look at this, Fahad, the, I mean, the atria are clearly talking. The ventricles yep. can't listen to that. So they come up with their own sort of slow, mm -hmm. regular escape yes. rhythm. But these ventricular escape rhythms are, are pretty unstable. Yep. Uh, and that's yep. probably why the patient's having these quite frequent uh, blackouts. But eventually, uh, I mean, this is very high risk, uh, isn't it, Far? Eventually, you run out of yes. escape rhythms. There's about 50%. I was looking this up. 50% six-month mortality in these patients. Without a pacemaker, yep. this patient's a goner. If they run absolutely. out of escape rhythms, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So this is an emergency; it needs to be admitted into hospital. One of the most prognostic, beneficial things you can do in cardiology: pacing a high degree AV block. Got a pacemaker, absolutely. There are a few things which are very satisfying in cardiology. But that's one of them, uh, absolutely. Yeah. But the key uh, thing, guys, so... is a cardiologist can't put a pacemaker in a patient who hasn't been diagnosed. So the, our, our job is to have a low threshold ECG, elderly patient bit of pre-syncope, definitely syncope, uh, and let's pick up that high degree heart block because it's so prognostically beneficial to intervene uh, in these patients. And I'm going to show you another ECG uh, for her and, and for the audience. This was another significant event review in my locality. Uh, this is a, another case, if you look, sort of fairly regular P waves, a very slow regular ventricular response, no relationship. This is actually another case of complete heart block. But for harder, um, the ECG machine has just put abnormal ECG, and this patient was referred routinely to cardiology. It took oh. a very sort of keen cardiologist to actually ask for the ECG, and it was only when he saw oh. the ECG that he upgraded that to an urgent uh, referral. So we can't. I mean, what we're trying to say is we can't. You know, the proprietary ECG software is very often suboptimal, even when it picks up the abnormality. Yeah. Okay. And actually not delineating the nature of the abnormality here is really problematic for the care of this patient. And that yeah. is really, really uh, fall down. Yes, it is an abnormal ECG. But well, you really talk us through this one because this, <laughs> this ECG machine thinks it's high degree AV block, a two to one AV block, which basically, as you say, is yeah. second degree type two. This caused a lot of anxiety for the patient. The reason the ECG was done for her this was a very fit young patient, but he noticed his heart rate was getting very slow at night, completely asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. You know, with these smartwatches, everyone's looking at their heart rate and he demanded an ECG. Yeah. The GP got very worried mm -hmm. and referred the patient uh, for an urgent cardiology review. But let's let's run the PM mm -hmm. cardio app on this patient. What do you make of this ECG for her? Well, this ECG looks like regular sinus rhythm to me, and um, it's reported as two to one atrioventricular block. And I'm just trying to think what the algorithm was seeing. And here, this is your cleaned up version for the PM cardio. When version. you run the app, when you run the technology, cleaned up it's version. Fine. When you get the when you run it, it clearly identifies clear sinus rhythm. And actually, um, um, uh, I'm we've looked at these ECGs before. Very difficult to see how the um, how the original ECG interpretation was so wrong. Just as just as that case that flutter we showed earlier, very difficult to see what the what these algorithms are seeing. And this is the advantage of this great technology; it really sees what the physician is seeing. Fantastic, right? It now gives me great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Anthony Demolder, a very impressive young research physician uh, with a specialist interest in cardiology and AI, and most importantly, uh, is one of the lead medical researchers at Powerful Medical, the company that developed and own the PM cardiology uh, AI ECG technology uh, that we've been demonstrating this webinar. So Dr. Demolda, uh, over uh, to you. Thank you very much, Asiya, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Anthony Demolder. I'm a uh, medical researcher at the uh, company Powerful Medical that brings you with this uh, exciting technology called PM Cardio. Um, and we at Powerful Medical are really attempting to lead the AI revolution in cardiovascular care. Now, if you go to the next, here we go. Um, allow me to show uh, another challenging ECG for you. Uh, I think it's my turn maybe to show another ECG. So um, 
this ECG, uh, I will not tell you the answer yet what the diagnosis is here. I will tell you at the end of my slides. But I think we can all agree, and it's already been shown during this webinar, that ECGs are truly a valuable diagnostic tool, um, especially for assessing patients with cardiac symptoms at the initial point of care. But as we all know, the ECG is not easy to interpret. It can be very challenging to interpret. If you look at this slide here, you can see nicely, this is from a meta-analysis of 78 studies showing that the accuracy of ECG interpretation can vary tremendously among physicians. This can be emergency department physicians, this can be GPs, but even sometimes among cardiologists, they can disagree on the diagnosis of an ECG. And this, of course, unfortunately, has a tremendous impact on patients. So we know, for example, that one in three acute myocardial infarctions are initially misdiagnosed. We also know that there is a high over-referral to uh, secondary care, and this is associated with increased health care costs. And we also know that, of course, how waiting times are in place uh, whenever you want to refer a patient to a cardiologist. Um, and these are some consequences that we see in every day. And this is also what actually motivated Powerful Medical as a company to do something about this. So maybe some information about Powerful Medical. Um, Powerful Medical was actually a company founded in 2019. It's a deep tech company really trying to improve healthcare. And we are trying to do this by using some very brain true techniques, some very groundbreaking techniques using big data, using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And what we really want to do is we want to augment the human made clinical decisions with AI. So people often ask me, will artificial intelligence replace me? And then I always tell them, no, artificial intelligence will not replace you. But a physician who is using artificial intelligence that's going to be the person who will replace you. So, of course, we at Powerful Medical, we, we don't do this by ourselves. We have this great, exciting interdisciplinary team of physicians, of data scientists, of AI experts, software engineers, and many more people. Um, currently, right now, there's already more than 50 of us working at three different locations. Um, and this is a great, dynamic, very energetic team, really going all out to tackle the ECG. And of course, this would not be possible without being backed by world-class cardiologists. Uh, already over 28 world-class cardiologists are uh, already supporting us. And maybe of note, we also have a seat at the ESC Innovation Committee. So that's also one of the nice achievements we managed to uh, get. And of course, when you bring together a team of this remarkable people, we try to really produce this, this exciting software called PM Cardio, the AI platform, really. Um, each and every one of you can freely download this software in the uh, App Store and try it out for yourselves. But if I walk through the key highlights, so we have, of course, we provide you with a precise AI diagnosis. We provide you with fast treatment decisions, treatment decisions recommendations that are truly based on the ESC guidelines themselves, so the most recent ESC guidelines. We are very accessible and compatible with any ECG format, meaning that sometimes you have different layouts, but we support any layout that your paper ECG has, even the ECGs on the screen. And of course, it's been clinically validated. And very interesting as well, we are a certified product. So we have a class 2B medical device. We have obtained this CE marking in Europe. So this is some very interesting stuff. The uh, steps of scanning and interpreting the ECG with our AI application, I will, uh, it's already been demonstrated. So basically you scan an ECG, you create a report, you get an AI diagnosis, and then you can also enter some patient information there. And based on the information you enter, you really get the ESC guideline-based treatment recommendations for this ECG. And I'm also happy to show you that we already have um, supported 38 cardiac diseases. Um, so we are certified for diagnosing these 38 cardiac diseases. And this brings me again to one of my first slides being the initial ECG that you have some time to hopefully already try to interpret yourself. Um, this ECG was actually a Parkinson patient coming to his GP asking for an ECG. 
And if you look closely, you would maybe guess or you would maybe think that this is atrial fibrillation. But if you look very closely, this is actually not atrial fibrillation. This is just a sinus bradycardia. And as you can see here and marked in red, these are actually P waves that were hiding between the trembling of the Parkinson patient. So the great thing here is that our application is actually able to detect this and to really help you in understanding and diagnosing this ECG in a correct way. I just uh, uh, interrupted Dr. Demolda. You'll be glad to know that quite a few of our audience uh, actually got that correct. So uh, I think that's probably a testament to Fahal's uh, teaching of, uh, of, of ECG. That's great. That's wonderful to hear. So at Powerful Medical, we promise you um, also for the future that we are continuing to work on these great algorithms that we have already provided to with you today. Um, so we are really providing a commitment to the future because in the future, we are also planning to do many more AI algorithms. We are planning to couple the echo data also to the ECG so we can really empower you much more with so many more things that we can do. So please, if you go to the next slide, please join us on this beautiful journey together. If you scan this QR code, you can get the application yourself. Join us on this journey and together in the future, I promise we will bring you many more great algorithms. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Demolder. That was a, a wonderful uh, overview. And what a great team uh, behind this uh, great technology. Uh, so I think we're now we're just going to have a, a wrap up with some of the uh, key messages and also a reinforcement of the great opportunity we have to embrace uh, this innovation, really streamline patient pathways. And ultimately, what, the reason we're all in healthcare is to uh, improve patient uh, outcomes. So I think there are several obvious issues in relation to 12 lead ECG interpretation in primary care. They're obvious, but I think they're worth highlighting. Clearly, there is a big variation in ECG interpretation skills amongst primary care clinicians. Uh, and that's not uh, a fault of primary care clinicians. We simply don't have enough volume uh, in terms of maintaining skills. And there, as we've uh, clearly established, an over-reliance on integrated ECG interpretive software, which uh, has low negative and positive prediction. And this can result in not just unnecessary referrals, and advice and guidance, which should be thought of as a very precious resource. I work across primary and secondary care. There are issues on both sides in terms of resource, uh, and we've got to treat it as a precious resource. Uh, there's misdiagnosis, there's overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis, and all of these things compromise the efficiency uh, of uh, patient care, as well as quality and safety. And as we've highlighted, uh, resulting in some catastrophic uh, consequences uh, on occasion. Uh, and advice and guidance pathways are really non-sustainable. You know, they're increasingly non-sustainable and actually likely to fuel onward secondary care referrals and unnecessary outpatient diagnostics, particularly ECHO. And I'm sure Fahar will be the first to agree it's very difficult when you're faced with an ECG without any or minimal clinical context, without being able to have the patient sitting in front of you, assessing the patient, and the path of least resistance or, or the low threshold is to simply get that patient uh, in and seen in secondary care. And it is difficult to marry the clinical picture uh, with the ECG findings. And that non-availability of real-time high-quality ECG analysis is really hurting us uh, because it's driving the uh, inefficiency of primary care workup uh, and, and results in increased follow-up and reviews. I think to put it simply, we cannot manage patients efficiently uh, at the time of their ECG appointment. Uh, that's the key uh, unmet need. And I think it's, it's really refreshing uh, and for me, very exciting that we have PM Cardio uh, that can address all of those unmet needs. It really is leading the AI revolution in cardiovascular care. I feel as they were already missing out because... To seven, oh, well over 17,000 physicians are already using this routinely uh, across Europe. It's got the CE certification as a class 2B EU MDR medical device, which is fantastic sort of clinical endorsement uh, and backing. So essentially what we're really reinforcing is that you can have the expertise of a cardiologist whenever you need it instantly. You know, we can get that ECG interpretation within seconds of doing the ECG.
we've seen what an exceptionally high positive and negative predictive value uh, this has, which is of, of that's the crux of this uh, technology. Uh, and also that immediate uh, signposting to evidence-based guideline recommendations for treatment, which can be bespoke and tailored to that individual characteristics. And that can hugely uh, reduce the need for referrals uh, and reduce unnecessary referrals, making the whole pathway more efficient and streamlining the diagnostic flow, uh, avoiding those unnecessary follow-ups and reviews. But again, I'm sure Fahar will agree with me, the very center of this technology the reason why it's a game changer is that we've now reached a stage where we can have exceptionally high, almost near perfect positive and negative predictive value and confidence uh, in that diagnosis. So I think uh, we've probably overrun slightly uh, according to our agenda, but I think it was well worth it because we had some great discussion. I'm now going to invite uh, the, my fellow presenters, if you can just uh, turn your cameras back on and unmute yourselves, because we've got a little bit time for Q&A uh, before I end uh, with some uh, closing uh, remarks. And uh, and maybe, Fahar, if I can come to you first. I'm not sure if you're able to turn your camera on. Or oh, that's probably problematic. Um, so maybe... Um, Maybe yourself, uh, Dr. Demolder, uh, there's been quite a few questions about further validation. I mean, we've seen it's already got excellent validation, but is this an ongoing process that uh, you're looking to get more and more data, more and more use in the real world? And not that you need it, but just to reinforce the confidence amongst clinicians uh, in terms of the accuracy of the uh, technology. Yes, it's a very good question. So. In the future, we are looking to validate uh, our software more and more. Um, it's already been validated in several uh, centers. Uh, we had some very amazing results on thousands of test cases with uh, expert annotation demonstrating that we're already doing it very well. Um, but of course, in the future, we hope more and more of these studies will come and independently validate our application. Fantastic. There's been quite a few questions on, on, on cost. I'm actually going to use my chair's um, executive powers to say I don't think we want to talk about cost. Uh, what we do know is we've got a QR code there that you can use and you can get a free trial version of this. We want you to be comfortable in, in, in the power of, of this. I can tell you right now the cost is ridiculously low. I mean, compared to... Um, you know alternatives that are, that are actually out there and commissioned in the NHS, but I don't. I, I, for me, today is all about clinical quality and patient safety and improving patient outcomes. And as uh, Dr. Demolder has reinforced, AI technology in conjunction with our own clinical nous and expertise is almost unbeatable. You know, nothing's going to replace uh, a physician. But when you when you pair it with AI technology, we can we can actually take a step change, a big step change in the efficiency and quality uh, of our care. There's been a I'm going to take this one, if you don't mind, Dr. Demolder. There's a question about what do you suggest for PVCs, premature ventricular contractions or, or ectopic beats? Now, this is a very interesting question, because when I first started practicing, we used to think they were fairly benign. Uh, but now um, it depends on the burden. You know, having lots of ventricular uh, uh, contractions uh, can actually uh, be a marker for underlying structural heart disease, but can also, in the long term, compromise cardiac function. So I think if you're if you've got a patient who's getting a lot of ventricular ectopics, we probably should be thinking of assessing the burden, and for that we need to um, get some sort of ambulatory ECG uh, test done to capture the burden. And and I have a very simple philosophy: if there's more than ten percent. Uh, ventricular ectopics uh, or uh, more than 10,000, uh, I think that patient really does need to be referred for further assessment. Uh, Fahar, unfortunately, is uh, having some technical issues, but he he's a past master at uh, assessing for ablation of patients with uh, frequent ventricular ectopics. And depending, obviously, it needs careful assessment, but there is a, a, a potential for being able to ablate the source of the ectopics uh, and sort of eradicate not just the uh, inconvenience of the ectopics, but also improve prognosis. Um, yeah, there's a question about... Also very important there. Sorry? 
Sorry, morphology of PVC. Morphology is, is important. Uh, uh, we want to keep it simple here, uh, Dr. Mold in <laughs> primary care, but you're absolutely right. So I think an EP cardiologist would be ideally placed to uh, to sort of uh, give that uh, give that assessment. Uh, there's a question about does a patient still need a DOAC after cardioversion? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is yes. At the moment, there is no evidence that categorically states that any rhythm control strategy, whether it's cardioversion or ablation, can remove the need for anticoagulation if the CHADS FAST score merits it. So we mustn't sell a rhythm control strategy as a means to stop your patient requiring uh, anticoagulation. The, the, the big role for cardioversion in modern EP cardiology, actually, is to identify those patients with AF who may benefit from an ablation procedure because a cardioversion usually is just a temporizing measure and often it's difficult to assess whether a patient's symptomatic from their AF maybe they've got other comorbidities so a, a cardioversion to get that patient temporarily back into sinus rhythm uh, is a really good thing to do to identify if there is going to be any symptom improvement and then maybe that we can have a more meaningful discussion as to the benefits of of ablation which is likely to offer better uh, sort of long term uh, um, uh, rhythm control. Uh, there's a question on, uh, maybe you can answer this, Demolder. You give your opinion from Belgium, uh, and I'll give you my opinion from the UK. But it says, how quickly should you be doing an ECG if you examine a patient in primary care and you find an irregular pulse? Let's say we got a an elderly patient with all the risk factors for AF. You find that irregular pulse. How quickly do you think we should be diagnosing the AF? So from a Belgian point of view, I would say just immediately. I totally agree with you. Uh, essentially, it's you're playing Russian roulette with this patient. Uh, you know, you can't predict when this patient, if they do have AF, is going to have a stroke. So basically, you want to get the diagnosis done as soon as possible. And 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 I think with availability of portable ECG technology, as well as uh, I think most practices in primary care would have access to twelve lead ECG. These are the sort of patients you really don't want to wait too long. You don't want them to have a stroke whilst you're waiting to confirm the diagnosis of AF. And now that we've got the AI technology, we can confirm that diagnosis the moment uh, they get that uh, they get that ECG uh, exactly. sort of diagnosis. I wish uh, there's a question as well, maybe. Um, the, the nature of atrial fibrillation can be paroxysmal. So that's also underlining that it's very important to try to take the ECG if the patient is having the symptoms, because otherwise you might miss it. Absolutely. In fact, uh, there's probably a lot more paroxysmal AF out there than most of us appreciate. Uh, and certainly people are going in and out of AF far more frequently than they're being symptomatic, which is another sort of issue that we're, we're aware of. Uh, there's another basic ECG question here about what to do with first degree heart block. Well, I think in my experience, uh, first degree heart block in isolation uh, really doesn't cause any issues because that AV node has got so much redundancy that you can you can basically accept quite a lot of AV node damage and, and it doesn't tend to cause any any issues. Uh, but the, the key thing is to always when you see one abnormality, conduction abnormality, you should always look for other abnormalities. And I think once you start getting first degree heart block in conjunction with other abnormalities, in particular things like bundle branch block, then you've got to be thinking about you know, more significant underlying conduction tissue damage, your bifascicular and your trifascicular blocks, as well as always factor in whether the patient's uh, symptomatic. In fact, Dr. Demolder, this is a very, I think, good point that we should reinforce. We should never interpret an ECG without clinical context. I mean, for me, I always want to know the age of the patient, the sex of the patient, any comorbidities. And most importantly, we need to know why the ECG was done. Uh, the indication for the ECG, it's, it's got to be part of the whole picture. Would you agree with that? Uh, and I guess that's why you put those clinical metrics uh, within the application. Exactly. So, of course, we, we want to look at more than the ECG itself. Um, patients with the same ECG can be managed differently depending on what the clinical context is. And we really try to incorporate that as well in our application by providing these questions that ask for the clinical context. And then based yeah. on the inputted questions, based on the answers, you really get yeah. directed down this algorithm, which uh, always will tell you if the patient would need to get referred, if the patient would need an ambulatory ECG, if the patient would need an echocardiogram, 
all these things uh, which are really based on the clinical context of the patient. Absolutely. I mean, if if someone handed me an ECG and it looks perfectly normal, but then they told me half an hour later, by the way, that patient had acute crushing central chest pain, I don't care what the ECG shows, uh, that patient needs uh, needs further sort of uh, careful assessment. So we must factor in the clinical context. And that's why I love the, uh, the PM Cardio app gives you that option to sort of input a lot of sort of patient clinical information. Uh, there's a question on uh, how do we uh, assess bleeding risk, obviously, in, in atrial fibrillation when we anticoagulate. Certainly in the UK, we've sort of moved beyond has bled. Uh, we now recommend the orbit score. But I think that the underlying message is the same. We mustn't use these bleeding risk assessments to stop us anticoagulating patients. That these bleeding risk assessments are there to identify how to sort of potentially mitigate bleeding risk, but always in a patient you're going to anticoagulate because because the stroke risk virtually always uh, trumps the bleeding risk. Uh, you can always replace blood. You cannot replace uh, infarcted brain tissue. So you should be mindful of the bleeding risk. Uh, but uh, uh, try and reverse uh, sort of the, some of the metrics that increase your bleeding risk, uh, but not use it as your excuse not to anticoagulate. I think it's very similar in the European guidelines, uh, Dr. Demolder, that, that yes. you're probably familiar with. Exactly. Um, I think we're going to ask one more question. So I'm very wary. We're past the 8.30. It's quite late uh, uh, in the UK for, for most of us. Um, what about... Um, there's a question here. I'm not sure what it refers to. It says, if the tracing is not good, can PM cardio interpret it accurately? So to, actually, you tell us, uh, Anthony, how does the PM cardio app? I mean, I've seen I've used it on some ECGs that look very, very poor quality. How does it actually improve the uh, the aesthetic quality of that ECG? What's it doing? Yeah. So an initial step is the digitization of the paper ECG, of course. So we have some amazing technological features that are uh, behind that, um, that really augment the quality of the ECG in the first place. Of course, you always have these ECGs that have terrible, terrible quality, um, even movement artifacts, uh, noisy ECGs, wandering baselines. Uh, and we know that this can affect ECG interpretation. Um, but fortunately in the AI uh, algorithm, we try to uh, really augment it during its training phase. So we already provided it with ECGs, with noisy baselines, with wandering baselines, with movement artifacts. So it's trained on those ECGs. So the diagnostics are very robust to these artifacts. And in addition, if the AI algorithm is unsure about its prediction of the diagnosis, then it will also state that on the diagnosis. So it will say, if it's a very messy ECG, it will say, ah, I have a low confidence on this diagnosis. Fantastic. I have to say the way it improves the quality of that ECG is uh, is almost a sight to behold sometimes. I, I, actually, I, I do want to weave in one last question because we, we didn't cover this. Once you scan the ECG and you've got the report, uh, there's a question about how can that be sent to other colleagues, maybe in the hospital? How do you upload it into the notes? I'm a, I mean, I know it. I mean, basically, it's because it generates a PDF. Uh, that that's the answer, isn't it, Doctor Tomorrow? Once you've got a PDF, you can send it anywhere. Yeah. So exactly. Um, I want to mention two things here. Um, first of all, the ECGs that are scanned, they are fully GDPR proof. So um, if you ever uh, wonder if uh, it's fully respectful to the patient identification, um, so it just takes the raw ECG signal, nothing else. Um, it's fully GDPR proof. And the report itself can actually be exported from the app. So you can export ECG and you can send this PDF report to your email, to your WhatsApp, um, to colleagues, uh, anywhere you want. I mean, it's it's so easy. I mean, I've been using it for so long. You, you, I have to say you've made a technology that's not just you know, very sophisticated in, in terms of what it does, but you've made it very user friendly. Uh, that we can uh, in incorporate into our routine clinical practice. So look, sadly, the time has uh, flown by, I think far too quickly, but I, I think I'm going to have to draw this webinar uh, to an end. Uh, so none of you have excuses not to do any housework. Uh, we're going to we're going to end this webinar uh, and release you. But uh, I hope all of you like me thoroughly enjoyed the session and found it a useful learning experience. I'd like to thank my fellow presenters, our very own uh, sort of legendary cardiologist from the UK, Dr. Fahar Khan, uh, 
Uh, I thought he was an absolute superstar as usual. And equally impressive colleague, uh, Dr. Anthony DeMolder, I thought you were both fabulous. I'm sure the audience gained tremendous value from your inputs. And my one take home message is that AI ECG interpretive technology as demonstrated by the PM Cardio app, I think has now clearly evolved to be sort of superior in accuracy to the vast majority of clinicians in both primary and secondary care. And it's certainly proven even to be a match uh, for cardiologists. So essentially, it's virtually impossible for most of us to compete with the machine learning of millions of ECG cases. And I believe we have now entered an era where we have to embrace technology like this, incorporate it into routine clinical practice, reduce unwarranted variation, streamline and improve efficiency of patient pathways, as well as uh, improve clinical quality and patient safety. Uh, and most importantly, as I said earlier, to ultimately improve the outcomes for our patients. I believe so passionately uh, that all clinicians now should have access to almost bulletproof, near perfect ECG interpretation every single time and all within seconds of generating an ECG. I'd also like to thank the amazing team at Powerful Medical for organizing this webinar. Uh, I know a lot of effort uh, and time has gone on behind the scenes to make this event happen. And they've done a tremendous job uh, and we've had an incredible number of attendees. I'm so sorry that there was no way we could answer every single person's questions, but I, I hope we gave you a, a very useful learning experience. And finally, I'd like to thank you, the audience, uh, for your kind attention, you know, great interaction, and also for investing your precious time to attend. But I very much hope uh, you found it to be a great return on that investment. Please, if you haven't already done so, scan this QR code to take you to the Powerful Medical website uh, to gain more information on the technology, uh, to gain more information on its validation, which is extremely impressive. And most importantly, uh, get that free trial access to the application. Have a lovely rest of your evening uh, and goodbye. Thank you very much, Yasir.